Billy, what are you doing now? Hello again. Uh, I've had a couple of requests for uh, an explanation of tissue fluid formation. So we'll start with that today and I might do a couple of other videos afterwards. So this is a uh, tissue fluid formation. Okay, so, you're probably aware all cells are surrounded by tissue fluid. Uh, they're bathed in tissue fluid. So when we talk about the exchange of substances between the blood uh, and the cells and tissues, we mean from the capillary into the tissue fluid and then the cells. So if we can imagine we have... Uh, it looks like this. So, what we have here uh, is a, um, a capillary. Uh, this is an arterial side. Um, and we call this end of the capillary bed the arterial. Oh. And over here uh, oops, is a venule, and we call this the venous end of the capillary bed. Okay, so arterial, capillary, venule, arterial side, venous side. So blood travels from the uh, from the heart by the aorta and eventually into an arterial and that blood is under high hydrostatic pressure and that high hydrostatic pressure is created by the contractions of the left ventricle. The blood travels via the arterial to the capillary under that high hydrostatic pressure. I'll rub that bit out there, we know this is the capillary now. At the arterial end of the capillary, that high hydrostatic pressure is still present. Uh, and what we find is under that high hydrostatic pressure fluid, water mostly, but other things uh, including glucose, amino acids, dissolved ions are forced out of the capillary due to that high hydrostatic pressure. Now, in the exams, they will expect that you include at least two uh, of the substances that move out of the arterial end of the capillary. I usually say, well, I usually say three. So I usually say water, glucose, and amino acids. But that could also include uh, ions and a few other things as well. The really important thing is that you include at least two of them, and just to be safe, why not stick three in? Okay, so, at that arterial end, as the water is forced out with the dissolved substances like glucose and amino acids, there are some substances left behind. So, these things are too large to pass out of the pores in the endothelial wall of the capillary, and they include uh, I'm just going to draw it as a triangle. Things such as the large 
plasma proteins. Now they're important, I'll come back to those in a second. As well as uh, red blood cells. Uh, and the other blood cells and platelets, etc. Now the significance of those large plasma proteins is that they lower the water potential. So they keep the water potential of the plasma that is in the capillary low. And that means, uh, because we've got all of this tissue fluid surrounding the capillary, which has a really high water potential, a water potential gradient is established. So high water potential here, and a low water potential in the capillary. Because of that water potential gradient, inevitably there will be some osmosis. I'll draw a bit bigger than that. So we've got movement here of water from the tissue fluid back into the capillary where it forms a plasma by osmosis. Now, just as an aside, but a really useful exam tip, the fluid inside the capillary is referred to as plasma. The fluid uh, which surrounds the tissues is a tissue fluid. We do not say that plasma leaves the capillary. It's water with those two other things, glucose and amino acids, for example. Likewise, here, we don't say that tissue fluid enters the capillary. It's that water that moves back in down that water potential gradient. Okay, what we notice here, though, is the loss of water due to that high hydrostatic pressure is greater than the osmotic uptake. And you see this um, on mark schemes written in a few ways. Okay, but it's important to remember that the, uh, the hydrostatic pressure is greater than the osmotic effect or osmotic pressure. So we have net movement of water out. About this uh, handwriting there, net movement out at the arterial end of the capillary. Now, as the blood travels in the uh, uh, the remains inside the capillary travels through the capillary towards the venous end, water is lost, and the friction between the red blood cells and the endothelial walls of the capillary. Um, causes the blood to slow down and that those two things combine to make the pressure the hydrostatic pressure much lower at the venous end however there is still some hydrostatic pressure so what we find is there is a little bit of water forced out due to that hydrostatic pressure at the venous end okay is much less than at the arterial end because the pressure well, has decreased. The osmotic effect, however, is still the same. Okay, there is still a high water potential in the uh, in the tissue fluid compared to a lower water potential in the uh, in the capillary. And in fact. Let's, uh, let's point out, let's refer to, rather than high and low, let's call it higher and lower. There. Often mark schemes will want this comparative statement, so a higher water potential in the tissue fluid, lower water potential in the blood. So we've got osmosis of water in, actually the, the rate of osmosis in at the um, arterial end is very similar 
to that at the Venus end. But already you can see that now the net effect is that we've got a net uptake of water from the tissue fluid back into the uh, back into the uh, into the capillary, and that is because now the osmotic effect, sometimes referred to the osmotic pressure, is now greater the hydrostatic. Pressure. So we have a net movement. Let's move my tea out of the way. <coughs> In. So a net movement of water from the tissue fluid back into the capillary. <coughs> I'm hoping that you can see here that. Overall, there is uh, an excess of water produced in the tissue fluid, or an excess tissue fluid. And that's because overall, the osmotic, sorry, the hydrostatic pressure forcing water and other molecules out is greater than the osmotic effect. So that brings into play another. Um, another network for transport, and this is the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is an open branching network of, uh, uh, of vessels, unlike the, uh, unlike the circulatory system, uh, there's no pump, it just requires and relies on a skeletal muscle. Uh, contractions and valves to push the fluid around. But what we find is that tissue fluid that has been formed, oops, see that is there. Due to the uh, hydrostatic pressure being greater than the osmotic effect overall over the whole length of the capillary, that excess tissue fluid. That's created drains into these lymphatic vessels. And tissue fluid, when it moves into the lymphatic vessel, is no longer referred to as tissue fluid, but instead as lymph. So, just as a reminder, we've got Plasma is the fluid in the capillary. Tissue fluid, the fluid surrounding the tissues. Any excess tissue fluid drains into the lymph. Uh, and that's returned back to uh, the uh, blood vessels in a, in a vein called the left subclavian vein, just below your clavicle. Um, and that is the formation of tissue fluid.